Welcome. If it's your first time to gospel on behalf of our dream team and our leadership team and all our overseers and everybody involved with this church, we are so glad to see you. If it is your first time, make sure you let us know on your way out. We want to bless you and just find out how we can serve you. But can we welcome all our first timers, y'all? Would you put your hands together real quick? Come on. We're grateful to see some new people today. And uh, I, I, if I wanted a dead church, I'd go to a cemetery. No, we, we love having fun in church. If you're new to this experience, please, uh, we, we like to keep it light. I believe the gospel, I believe the gospel is deep enough to change someone's life. But when we do it together, it's simple enough to actually understand and make sense of this, you know, ancient old book that sometimes we just kind of mystify. Uh, but we believe the word is alive. We believe he's active. We believe that God is speaking today. He's speaking over Western New York in this time, in this season. And uh, just like Esther, we believe gospel is being raised up for such a time as this. And there are people that are turning their back on God, not because of God's fault, just because they don't understand all the people that represent God. And so we try to keep it simple. We try to welcome anybody that's willing to hear. And uh, I just am so glad to see you this morning. I want to jump straight into the word, though, today. If you have your Bible, go to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1 will be our beginning text today. And we love the Bible here at Gospel. Amen. That's a good part. Uh, yes, we, we believe the word of God is more than just some principles and some words and some Facebook statuses. We believe it's, it's God's word. And uh, today we're jumping into what's known as the Old Testament the Old Testament, believed to be written about 2,000 to 4,000 years ago, right in that time frame. And basically what happened is Moses was called to Egypt to rescue the Israelites out of Egypt. And many of you have heard this story. Moses goes in, he tells Pharaoh, let my people go. And they get out of Egypt. And they get out in one night. It takes them one night to get out of Egypt, to leave all that stuff behind. But for 40 years, they wander through the wilderness, trying to make sense of where they're going. You can be brought out of an environment in one night, but sometimes it takes a little longer to get that environment out of you. Y'all with me? Sometimes it takes the residue of past seasons can stick to you. And so we pick it up right in the middle of the wilderness season, verse 6. It says, The Lord our God said to us in Horeb, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn, take your journey, go to the hill country where the Amorites and all their neighbors and the Arabah and the hill country and the lowland and the Negev and by the sea coast, the land of the Canaanites and Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. God loves to be specific, doesn't he? All these names mean something. You don't have to remember them, but it just shows you God cares about details. Verse eight, see, I have set the land before you. Go in, someone say go in. And take possession of the land the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you and their offspring after them. I want to title this message this morning, Move Out Sunday. It's simple as that. It's Move Out Sunday, y'all. We're moving out as a church. I believe God's moving some things in our lives out. And I believe today is going to bless you. So let's pray. Father, help us as we try to open up your word. Without you, Holy Spirit, this is nothing. For my friends that are new to church, my friends that are new to an environment like this, make this real to them. Make this more than just words. Make it deeper that you know them as, as the words being preached. So we love you. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name. And if you believe it one more time, say amen. Amen, amen. Turn to someone next to you and say, I'm moving out. I'm moving out. I'm moving out. Billy's song. Come on. Thanks, brother. Uh, anybody here watch a lot of Netflix? Some honest people in church, uh, don't worry, your pastor watches Netflix too, and uh, my wife and I, we have a set amount of Netflix we try to watch, and usually it's kind of like a de decompression time, like get to just wind down, chill out, you know, throw on a show for 30 minutes or something like that. And so my wife was watching the show with me one time, and, and I had been engaged for about five episodes, you know, over the course of time, and she's looking at me and she says, can we just fast forward to the good part? And, and I said, well... This is kind of a lame episode. I guess we get to the end because I just want to see what this prosecutor is going to do. And I was explaining the story and stuff. And so we just kind of grabbed it and kind of fast forwarded to the end and, and got to the last scene of the thing. And I said, wow, what if every show was like that? I just got to the good parts and I didn't have to sit there for weeks and weeks at a time and engage in this show. And it just kind of hit me as we were watching that show. I have a tendency to do that in life sometimes. I have a tendency to want to just speed up to the good parts to just kind of push past the things that are taking time. Have you ever been impatient before? 
You ever felt like God has spoken to you about something or maybe a job offer or some sort of manager in your life said, hey, we're going to lead you to this position eventually. And after a while, you just, you just get tired of waiting. Am I the only one? I feel like in life, that is the everyday challenge we are faced with. Are we going to be good with waiting or are we going to be bad with waiting? Are we going to get frustrated when we wait? Or are we going to look for joy and moments of opportunity in our waiting? It's like we want to wait sometimes a little too long, and then God finally does it, and it's almost as if we're not ready. So I want to fast forward to the good parts. What about pausing the good parts? You ever been in a season in your life where you're like, man, if we could just stay right here, like if my kids could not grow up anymore, you know, if my salary couldn't get cut, you know, if these new mandates didn't come in, come on, somebody, like, all this kind of stuff. Like if we could just pause right here, things would be great. I've, I've noticed that when we enjoy certain seasons of God's goodness, it's to prepare us for things that are ahead. God is not interested in just blessing us just to bless us. This isn't a bless you club. This isn't come to gospel church where you're blessed and everything else is not blessed. No, God blesses us and then he gets us to move on so that we can be used for his glory. Someone say amen. How, how, why don't we move on, though? Here's three quick reasons why I think we don't move on in life. There's too much time or money or recesses, resources invested in here where we're at. So a lot of people will say, I don't want to move on because I've already taken this many classes or I've already invested this much time in the relationship or I've already given this much money to this thing that I, I'm not leaving. I got what I need here. Secondly, a lot of people don't move to there because happiness is associated with here. Does this make sense? So I find joy and happiness because I'm here. And I tell myself, here is what gives me happiness. And so when God shows us there, we're like, but I'm happy here. Or third, comfort is found in the potential of here. It's not good, but it could be there. You, you ever been in a relationship before and you're like, I can fix them. It's not, really, it's not really what I deserve, but if I invest enough time in it, I can probably turn it around. And we find comfort in the potential. I know I'm stepping on toes. Some of y'all are looking at me like, why are you going there, Bishop? Come on, Bishop. You know, I'm telling you, there is something about here that the devil loves to get us comfortable with here. And I don't know. I, I think God's done some great things here. As a church, I look at here as this place. God's done some amazing things here. God has restored families here. God is building marriages here. God has healed people. We've seen backs healed here. We've seen kids that never stepped foot in a church, never want to go to church, actually want to be a part of helping at the church now. Like we've seen miracles here, but sometimes here is just to prepare us for there. What you thought was a breakup in your past relationships was actually a blessing because it was preparing you for the person you were meant to be with. That job you thought was a waste of time, it had given you the skills to prepare you for where you were going. In the wilderness, Moses and the children of Israel, the Bible says in verse 6, they were at Horeb, which was this big mountain, and apparently they had spent a lot of time at this mountain. I know this because God speaks in verse 6 and says, you have stayed at this mountain long enough. He tells him, you guys want to get to the promised land? You want to get to out of Egypt and take my people into where they're supposed to be? He says, okay, well, you got to move from here to there. The Israelites were no stranger to being impatient. For 40 years, they wandered the desert. They complained. They murmured for 40 years. The Bible says that, that their clothes grew with them. Like there's a verse in Numbers that says that they never grew out of their clothes, meaning even when we wander, God still provides for us because he's trying to lead us to where we're supposed to be. So they're wandering through the wilderness and they start getting frustrated with Moses. They're like, we should have never left Egypt. We had cucumbers in Egypt. We had fruit and vegetables in Egypt. And, and you got to watch out for those people because there's some people that as you're moving forward, they will remind you of the past season. They will tell you, you remember when we used to go smoke together. You, you remember when we used to go like after, out to the clubs together. You, you remember that and they'll tell you all the fun times because if you leave, who are they going to hang out with? <laughs> there is something about here that wants to keep us small, but I'm believing God hasn't called me and my wife here to Western New York to build something small. I believe he's calling us to build something big. And, and hear me when I say this, not big in numbers, big in impact. Big in a sense that changes people's understanding of who God is. Makes God real to them. 
I'm sorry, the words in this book are too powerful for us to think that they're just history or ancient literature. God, I believe, is moving us from here to there because he's preparing us. So let me give you a few thoughts, reminders, if you will, as you are moving forward. Um, you see these carts over here. These were, uh, we, we, we purchased these for the movie theater. And so our teams every week are gonna load up all our equipment, take it off the trailer, put it into the movie theater. And so I found out about a company, they custom make them for churches, they work with churches, we got a bunch of them. So I told two of our guys, I said, hey, we're gonna drive down to North Carolina, pick these carts up, and we're gonna come right back. And uh, I remember it was 20 something hours I was in the car with two of our guys. Listen, you don't really like somebody until you can hang out in a car with them for 22 hours. Can I hear an amen? I'll go even farther than this. You're not even married to your spouse until you can sit in a car with them for a long amount of time. And I remember we were going and the carts are 72 inches and 0.3 inches or something like that. And so I'm driving, I learned, lean over to Dave. I go, how, I go, how tall is this trailer? He goes, it's 72 inches. And in my head, I'm like, 72 inches. Should I tell him it's actually 72.3? We'll be fine. We'll be fine. It'll fit. I'm just like, it'll fit. Sure enough, y'all, 10 hours to get there. We load them in. <laughs> they don't clear the trailer. And so Dave, of course, these guys are like, handyman. I'm like, let's get a latte. They're like, let me get a saw real quick. They cut this thing open. You know what I mean? Pushed it in. And all I kept telling myself as we were hitting the top of that thing, I was like, you know what? We're just going to keep moving forward. Things aren't, might not go exactly as we want. We're going to keep moving forward. Keep pushing ahead. Sometimes we give our mistakes too much credit. And we don't give God enough opportunity. Sometimes we give our mistakes too much credit. We say, well, I messed up, so that means everything is over. And we don't give God enough opportunity to still do something. So three reminders. You don't need to hear anything new today. You just need to be reminded of some things that are true. So three things to be reminded of. Number one, when God blesses us, kind of alluded to it a second ago, he blesses us to go bless others. God blesses us to go bless others. Stephen Furtick says, God doesn't just want to get something to you. He wants to get something through you. He says, God doesn't just give us stuff to give it to us. He gives it so that it'll flow through us into the lives of people that need him. Verse six again, it says, the Lord God said to us in Horeb, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. In other words, I'm not just going to be with you for you. I need to get you from where you are to go to others that are in need of you. Church is more than an individual experience. We will cater it for an individual experience. Like we have individuals that don't want to be touched during the COVID pandemic. So if you don't want to be touched, grab one of those red stickers, put it right on your chest. I promise you, no one on our team will touch you because we want to serve you. We, we, want to, we want to make sure you feel comfortable when you come. Not everyone's like that. That's cool. So we will try to give an individual experience, but church is not an individual experience. It's a collective agreement that the higher power, that is God, is the one that we're in, is in control. And when we come together, we look to him. God's calling us to look beyond church attendance and church consumerism. He's looking for us to be the church and to be okay with encountering him on a Sunday and then seeing him move in other people's lives throughout the week. Is this making sense? Can I demonstrate this with another passage of scripture? Uh, Matthew chapter 17. I want to show you a quick story, and I'll show you that God's blessing us to go bless others. It says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, so three guys, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. So in other words, they get up to this mountaintop, and he turns, like, shines like the sun, just bright as can be. They, they're just blinded almost by him. And his clothes became white as light, verse 3. And behold, there appeared to him Moses and Elijah talking with him. I wish I could give you more on Moses and Elijah and why they're there and what that represents. Go to verse 4, please. And verse 4 says, And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we're here on top of this mountain. We're encountering you. I see Moses and Elijah. Obviously, God's doing something. It's good that we're here. If you wish, I will make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Peter had this awesome moment. And then he says, well, let's just stay here on the mountain. Why the tents? The Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was a reminder. Every year, Jewish people celebrate this. It was a reminder that while Israel was in the wilderness, they built these booths, tents, and they were covered by God. So to this day, like you go into like Hasidic Jew communities in New York City, you'll see them on the balconies. People build these little huts every time because the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles represents that season. Peter says, let's just stay here and celebrate. 
And eventually God speaks and tells him, no, I need you to go back down the mountain. Here's why. Because if God speaks to you in a mountain season, it's to use you in someone else's valley season. I'm on the mountaintop. Everything's great on the mountaintop. Peter heard from God. Everything's great. You ever just kind of want to be your own Christian? Let me listen to my own music and just God bless me. And, you know, I, I remember praying when I'd be driving around the desert where we're from and I would pray, God, I just want you to use me. I just want you to send me people that need you. And then like all these troubled youth would show up at our church, like gang members and like drug addicts. And I'd be sitting there like, well, can you, could you send me something easier? Because when we ask God, he's going to use us. He's going to use us. It's not for you to be in the mountain season to hear it yourself. It's because he wants to use you in someone else's valley season. Secondly, God has a place set apart for us. I want to encourage you today. This is good news. No matter what season you've been in, God has a plan for your life. I've heard preachers say this to me for years. I was like, how so? And I thought it was this glamorous plan. No, it just no, just no. God, the creator cares enough to even have a plan for you. Jeremiah 29 says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans not to harm you, but plans to prosper you. Look at verse 7 of Deuteronomy 1 again. Turn, take your journey, go to the hill country, the Ammonites, their neighbors, or Rabbi, the hill country, the lowland, the Geb, the seacoast, the Canaanites, Lebanon, as far as the great river, the far as the river Euphrates. God has specifically set apart these details for Israel. And he says, I'm not just giving you some promised land. He's saying, I'm giving you the specific area, the specific territory. There is something for you that he has specifically. I can prove it. Look at John 14. Jesus speaking to his disciples, same concept. They're all scared. They're worried. The world is falling apart. They're worried that Jesus is going to get arrested. Something's going to happen. Stuff is changing. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, right? Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back, take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Notice the, spec the specificity of Jesus. He says, I have a place I'm going to go prepare for you. So as you move on, as you let go of past seasons, it's not to be hurt and, and have trauma and live in that hurt forever. It's because there's something prepared for you over there. Uh, as a church planner, I've had the experience of meeting so many individuals that were a part of other churches. Uh, we have former pastors in our community. We have people that were part of big churches, small churches. We have people that hate church, people that love church. We have people that have questions about church, people that know the kind of church they want to be in. Like we have people across the board. But I can't help but notice every time I talk to somebody that has been hurt in a church. People that have either been let down by someone in authority or they had a split or something happened. And, and it's real, y'all. Your church is your family. Like, you, you don't choose your family. It just kind of happens. And before you know it, you're a part of a community and you're like, these are my people. But know this, God gives us space to grieve when we get, have to move on. But he also doesn't want us to waste too much time remembering what was when there's opportunities and potential for what can be. Does that make sense? I'll give you an example. There was a man named Saul. And uh, Saul was just a normal guy in the Israel camp. And one day all these people said, we want Saul as our king. They kind of looked at Saul. They said, you know, he looks good. He looks like everything we want. He's a good leader. He talks good. You know, he says things the way we want him to say. Let's vote him in. And they all kind of voted for him. And Saul became king. And uh, Saul wasn't very good, y'all. He wasn't chosen by God. Because people can like you, but it has to be God that calls you. Someone say, amen. We're not doing this for popularity. I'm not, I'm not a preacher for popularity. I remember preaching in youth group, and then I used to have couples would be breaking up after church, and boyfriends would be coming trying to fight me and stuff, talking about, why are you telling my girl to break up? I was like, I just preached the gospel, man. I didn't do anything else, you know. But, like, it, it just happens. There's that, that thing. And so Samuel was the one that chose Saul, and the Bible says Samuel got depressed about Saul. He says, Saul messed up, and I chose him. I, 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 I voted for him. It didn't go as I planned. You know, everything's going like this. It's just, what the heck is happening here? There's confusion. Everyone's frustrated. And then the Bible says in verse 1, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? Like, I know you chose him, Samuel, but how long are you going to sit and sulk in this Saul moment? Since I have rejected him from being king. 
Fill your horn with oil and go, and I'll send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king from among his sons. I want you to notice this. When Samuel anointed Saul, he would have poured out this ram's horn with oil. And in those days, if you were going to get anointed as king, they would put you in front of everybody, and they would pour oil on you, and it was a representation of the unity amongst the people, and it's this whole teaching. And so Samuel wasted his oil on Saul, and now the Bible says his horn is empty. And the longer that Samuel grieved, the longer his horn stays empty. The moment that he recognized, wait, there's somebody else waiting for me. David is over there, and he's going to get anointed. The longer Samuel stayed here, the longer David had to wait over there. See, when we don't move on in certain seasons in life, there's people waiting for us in the next season that have to wait longer. I remember contemplating, should we move from California to New York? And, and we just had these ups and downs and emotions and all over the place. And people didn't like it over there. And they were asking. And some people were for it. Some people weren't. And I had all this stuff in me. And the only thing that kept me recognizing this was God was all y'all. Because I knew there's people waiting. What do you mean? You're going to leave all this? You're going to do all this? I, I just see people waiting. I see a couple that tried to start a church in the movie theater before. I see a pastor that was a part of a church that was a part of the glory of God hitting this region that then split. I see a couple that hasn't been to church in years because of the pandemic, and they never thought they would go to church again. I see a young man who watches Stephen Furtick online right down the street and said, there'll never be a church like this in western New York. There was people waiting on the other side. Here's my question to you. Who's waiting on the other side of your obedience? Which family members just waiting for that text? Which, which coworkers just waiting for that apology? Well, which person is just waiting? I don't know what it is, but the obedience is connected to somebody else. As we move forward as a church, may we never forget there's people waiting on the other side. As I close, not only does God bless us to bless others? Not only does he have a place set apart for us, but number three, God's promise is generational. God's promise is generational. We, we are going to um, pray at the end of the service, and today our team is taking some time to, to pack everything up. I think we're going to have some food come in and just kind of hang out. Um, So I want to be a little short to give some space for our dream teamers just to kind of get built up. But let me close this out with this idea. When God speaks something over you and says it's time to move on, it's not just because it's about you. God speaks generationally. So your family before you, your parents, they might not have been the most religious or they might have been super religious. All the words that have been spoken over your family are connected. How do I know this? Because God identifies himself in the Bible as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Throughout the Old Testament, he would reveal himself and he would say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then later in the Genesis, the Bible says that Jacob, uh, he, he wrestles with God and his name gets changed to Israel. And then there's a few times in the Old Testament where you see God, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Like he recognizes the generations. And so I used to always get frustrated with this because I have friends that are in ministry and they're all pastors and their dads were pastors and their dad's dads were pastors and and, and my dad worked for a uniform company. And my parents didn't really bring me to church. And in my family line, I I know, you know, we came from Italy, but I don't really know much about our faith. And sometimes we talk ourselves out of God speaking to us because we say, well, no one in my family was religious or I'm the only Christian in my family. Not knowing that if God speaks over your life, it spills out into your family. As Joshua said, as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. The house doesn't have to be in agreement for you to declare that, just so you know. Well, as for me and my two kids and not my son because he's questioning God right now, we serve the Lord. No, you declare it by faith. As for me and my house, we serve the Lord. So there's a generational promise. Look at verse 8, Deuteronomy 1 still. It's move out Sunday, y'all, and I'm declaring by faith there's generations attached to this thing. See. Pause. Wait. Like, he's speaking to Moses. He goes, see. Just remind yourself. I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession. I, I, I think it's easy to just get comfortable looking at the land assessing the land, giving your opinion on the land. But it's different to go in and take possession. 
Go in and take possession of the land, the land that I've swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. Paul would write later about Abraham and Romans chapter 4, he would highlight the same kind of idea that this takes faith, that God's promise requires us to respond in faith. Uh, look at Romans chapter 4. It says, that is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one that shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Okay, generationally idea. Next verse. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed. Here it is. All this just to get you here. All this just to get you here. This is God who gives life to the dead. Amen. And calls into existence the things that do not exist. So this is what God does. God created everything from nothing. God has the ability to speak things into existence. When he said, let there be light, as soon as he said, let, molecules started forming together. That's the power of his word. If he calls you healed, he is speaking from a healed perspective. It says, he is the God that calls those things that be not as though they are. What does that mean? I came home with an F, mom. I'm not calling you a failure. I'm speaking over you. You will get good grace. And not like as a threat by faith. Why well, I might relapse again. I might fall back into things again. There's been so many times in my own recovery from getting through things that I would say, I'm just going to mess up again. Might as well just go do it all over again. And we speak, we speak like we're going to mess it up before we even try. But your words have power, don't they? So I'm not going to speak that. I'm going to speak the life of God. People are afraid. People are going to die. It's going to be a rough winter. No, I reject that. I speak life over our country. I speak the power of God over our country. We're not going to sit here and say, oh, a bunch of people are going to die. If it happens, it'll happen. But we're not going to speak that over our people. We're going to speak life because God calls those things that be not as though they are. He says, proclaim it. Here's the thing uh, about faith. It, it can't just be believed. It has to be declared. Faith is like not just for you to believe it, like, oh, I believe it. It's for you to speak it. Job 22 says this, last scripture, you will declare a thing and it will be established for you. The power, I'm not talking about like manifestation or name it and claim it stuff. Some of that gets a little loopy. People will be like, I want a house in Jesus' name. Where's my house? That's not how it works. But there are things in the will of God. Jesus said, whatever you ask according to my will, I'll give to you. In the will of God, when we claim it by faith, speak it over our situation, it builds us up. There was a woman in our church years ago. Uh, her name was Linda. And uh, I met Linda because she had gotten diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer. And uh, many of you know my testimony. So at my, our last church, a lot of cancer patients, we had a ministry. We would help them. We, you know, we'd, we'd serve them however we could. We'd give them advice. We'd pray with them. And I remember I started journeying with her. And uh, Linda would send me a prayer on, 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 text me a prayer every single day. God, I thank you that I'm this. I thank you that I'm that. I pray this. I pray that. And I remember going to see her in chemo treatment. And uh, she said, you get my prayers, right? And I said, yeah. She goes, Pastor, I'm going to keep declaring it. I'm going to keep declaring my healing, keep declaring my healing. I said, okay. And then she would send me those prayers every single day, every single day. Eventually, I got the call that Linda uh, moved into hospice care. And she wasn't doing good. Treatment was not good. And you got to remember, I'm 23 years old and Linda's, you know, 65. And I'm sitting there and we're talking about Jesus together in hospice and and, and I remember she leans over and she hands me this notebook and it has all her prayers in it. And she says, I want you to take these. And I said, okay. She goes, I'm not saying goodbye because I will be healed. And she gives me her prayer book. And uh, I remember walking out and a couple of days later, Linda passed, moved on to be with Jesus. And we took her prayers and we, we typed them up and we sent them out as Linda's prayers. We made them into 365 in her honor and in her memory. And I remember coming out of the hospital and I remember praying, God, heal her, heal my friend, heal her, heal her, heal her. And the Lord spoke to me and said, if I heal her, it'll be in a way you could never understand. 
So when I got the call that she had died, God still healed in a way that even I couldn't understand. Friends, may we never call something dead because God's idea of life and death is different. So I want to give you a couple declarations for 2022 our last Sunday together before the new year starts. These are five things I was praying this week. I wanna share them with you, just things that I'm declaring over my life. First of all, I'm declaring God's hand upon me and my family. What do I mean by his hand? I'm not talking about like his protection, like Lord, keep us safe. I, I don't see much of that in the Bible. Lord, keep us safe. Disciples praying for protection. Guys, we are in this world. It is scary. God will be with us and he will cover us and he will protect us. But I'm not praying for him to protect me from harm. I'm just praying for his hand to be on me that if harm does come, he's with me. That if this pandemic does keep going and going and going, he's with us. So I'm praying God's hand upon me and my family in 2022. I'm praying God's favor and his unction upon my decisions. Any business people in the room? Any people that own a business, wanna work, wanna do things? We declare over your year that God's favor and unction will be upon your dealings, upon your decisions, upon the things you do for work, his hand, his, his unction on you. Third, I'm praying God's love and life would be poured out into mine, that the love of God by faith would be poured into mine so other people feel it. Number four, I'm, I'm, I'm declaring God's plan to be activated in my community. And I want you to hear this, not just Western New York. I live in Fredonia, uh, like right by the college. I'm praying for God's plan to be activated like on my street, like on my neighbors, like, like on people that might never come to my church. Like I'm praying for God's plan to still be activated. And lastly, I'm praying for God's kingdom to show up here. So by faith, let's be a church that speaks things out. Drug addicts are going to come to our church. They're not drug addicts. They're children of God. Well, you know, homosexuals are going to come to our church. We don't declare that by faith. They're children of God. Well, you know, people that hate church, no, we declare by faith they're children of God. Let's get into their lives. Let's work through discipleship, and we'll get there when we get there. But let's not be a church that assesses and analyzes. Let's be a church that loves and accepts and welcomes people. Because if you speak life into somebody long enough, life will show up. Amen. So I want to speak some life into yours tonight this morning tonight i'm just ready to move out y'all i'm so excited i'm so excited to pack this trailer and just be done i want to speak some life into the room because you're not what people have called you you're not what people think about you you are who god says you are you are the apple of his eye you are highly beloved he's thinking about you he if he had a wallet your picture would be in it there's something about recognizing his love not as an not as a license to sin too some people hear this and they're like oh yeah gospel's one of those do whatever you want churches i'm like no guys come on no the love of god comes in and then it changes things through relationship and so, Father, by faith, I speak over our people today that we would be a house that always walks in the things of God, that our steps would be ordered of you, that our mindset would look and feel and think like you, that our hands would go where you reach, our feet would go where you walk. Today, God, we declare by faith we are your people. And 2021 brought a lot of things, but right now we declare God's hand upon every person in this room for 2022. We declare God's hand over their family, God's favor over their dealings, love and life into theirs. We pray plans would be activated in neighborhoods, on street corners, in cul-de-sacs, and we pray your kingdom would show up in Western New York. We love you. We bless you in Jesus' name. And if you believe it, say amen, amen, amen. Come on, you receive that today, church. A um, couple quick announcements. We're going to close with the time of generosity here. This is on your, on your uh, chair when you came in. We left two for you just to kind of challenge you to invite somebody. Um, you'll notice that launch Sunday is on January 23rd. And so that is four, four Sundays 
Four more Sundays uh, until we have our grand opening service at the Movieplex. Um, we're anticipating anywhere from like two to 300 people for that week. And then you'll notice like there'll kind of be a natural dip. It'll kind of decline. So this is like church planning stuff. So don't get discouraged if you come on launch and there's like, it's packed out. And the next week there's like 100 less people. Just people get excited about events and, you know, there'll be pastors from other churches coming. Uh, we have some local people that normally attend other churches are going to come attend gospel that day just to celebrate. Um, but I want to invite you to come next Sunday. We're going to be there the 2nd, the 9th, and the 16th. Uh, we're going to set up. We're going to have worship. There'll be a message. We'll do breakdown. Kids is going to be open. I'm just going to ask you to give us a little grace the next two Sundays. You know, we might be like 10 minutes late or like a screen might not be working. Uh, you know, we, we want to give a few weeks to get it right. Uh, but I do want to invite you for that, and it'll be awesome. And then secondly, I want to pray uh, for our time of generosity, and I'll dismiss. Um, we, we've, we've had a lot of people ask us about equipment. We're pretty much done buying stuff. We've, we, we had an idea of what we wanted to... Uh, spend on our launch we came in about thirty thousand dollars less than that so we're starting with money and savings we're starting thinking about this next year um you know you'll get to meet some of our overseers my board members are going to be here at launch and so they'll give some updates to our teams and and just to bring you guys in like once we launch it'll feel like a weight's been lifted uh, because things are moving forward. So I want to thank you for your generosity. If it's your first time, don't feel pressured to give. We never want to ask you for money. Uh, we just want to ask you to God. We want you to ask God what, what you think that means. Um, you know, sometimes God is like, give $5 to me. Sometimes he's like, give 500. Sometimes he's, you know, well, I don't think I've ever given five grand. I'm not ready for that. In my name, in Jesus name, help me, Lord. Um, but, but he will speak to you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm rambling, y'all. Help me out. Uh, he, he will speak to you. I'll say that. All that to say, he'll speak to you. It's not about how much you give. Uh, it's how open your heart is when you give. Um, on your way out today, you'll see some volunteers with a bucket. Feel free to drop it in. If you've got questions about my message, questions about our experience, uh, feel free to come up after. If you need prayer, there's always people up front ready to pray for you. Uh, but thank you for being a part of this season at Gospel. Uh, we'll look back on our one-year anniversary, and you'll see images of this warehouse. And some of y'all that are still there will look and say, I was there. I was there. So thank you for being a part of the ground floor. Let's pray one more time. <laughs> I like to keep uh, former Catholics on their feet. You know, just stand, say amen, do this, do that. Here we go. Let's pray again. I'm sorry, y'all. I need some coffee. Um, <laughs> Father, we love you. No disrespect to Catholics. We love them. Uh, Father, we love you. Thank you so much for what you've done in this season of our church. Oh, God, bring us closer. Bring us further. We're ready to move on. Where there is a hesitation to move, Speak to us and get us to move. Thank you for this time of generosity. Bless the people as they give. Uh, those that aren't given today, just start tickling some interest in them. Um, just not for the church, but so their joy can be fulfilled. So we love you. We bless you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. We love you guys. Have a great Sunday. Go Bills. And uh, remember, next week at the theater, we will see you on the second. Be blessed, everybody.